So um, as Jake said, I'm going to be talking about um, things that are both possible uh, and impossible uh, for engineering. And I'm going to be talking about these things in three distinct contexts. So the first, um, the, in the realm of feedback control, um, feedback stabilization. Then I'm going to say something about these applied Koopman operator uh, methods that, um, uh, by my estimation, have been percolating a lot into the robotics literature in the last decade or so. And uh, finally, I'll say something about um, uh, auto encoders, uh, which you can create with using deep neural networks. So, um, so to be with the first topic, um, feedback stabilizability, I'm going to tell or, or remind you, uh, in case you already know about something called Rocket's necessary condition, uh, the condition that gives you an obstruction to feedback stabilization. I'll also talk about uh, um, results along the same lines due to Peron and Mansuri, and I'll talk about how to generalize those. Um, and then we'll see some interesting uh, connections with the question of uh, stabilizing periodic orbits. So, um, so where to begin? I'm just going to begin with this kind of the standard setup of control theory: uh, x dot or dx dt equals f of x comma u. Um, so x are the states, u's are the controls. And for me, it's going to be important that x is not just living in some kind of Euclidean space. Um, uh, but it's going to be important that, that, that X lives in a smooth manifold. Um, why? If you're going to just talk about stabilizing points and you're on a manifold, sure, just zoom in on the point and the point becomes a Euclidean space. But if we're talking about stabilizing things like periodic orbits or other things that can wrap around the manifold in a global way, you really do need the global setting. Uh, you can also consider one in a, you know, in a more general uh, framework, but I, I, won't, I won't talk about that. So in control theory, there are at least two fundamental problems. Uh, there's more, of course, but here are two of them. So one, which I'm not going to talk about, except uh, in order to make a comparison on the next slide, is the controllability problem, which is all about if you have points A and B, two points, uh, you want to find some control, U of T, such that when you plug it into that right-hand side in equation one, when you plug in U of T, the unique solution of that equation, uh, starting at point A, goes to point B, at least at some time in the future. So controllability is all about going from point A to point B. The stabilizability problem is different. So given a compact set, classically usually an equilibrium point, but any compact uh, subset, so for an RN that just means closed and bounded uh, subset, um, let's find a smooth control. So U depending only on the state X. So of course you could also be interested in U depending on, on T, U of X comma T. Um, but I'm just gonna study this case, U is a function of X only. Um, so this is like reactive control, as they would say in code lab. Um, so I'm looking for a smooth U of X. And so when I plug in U of X into the right-hand side for U in equation one, uh, it makes, the goal is to make this subset A asymptotically stable uh, for the closed loop vector field, which is just what you get when you plug in U of X for U. Um, what does asymptotically stable mean? Uh, let me just show you a video of like, what I have in mind. So this is a video from Russ Hedrick's lab. And there's a very actually chaotic, unstable system, which is made stable. It's made to, to stabilize that thing uh, upright, even though naturally it wouldn't want to do that. Um, mathematically, uh, this is the shortest way I can think of the definition. It means for any vicinity of your compact set, there's a smaller vicinity. So that if you start in the small vicinity, you stay in the big vicinity for all forward time, but then you also converge eventually to the subset. So um, let's go back to 1983. So um, 1983, we'll talk about this case where that I mentioned where the compact set A is just a single point. Um, and let's take our state space to just be Euclidean space. So according to Roger Brockett, it was an oft-repeated conjecture in 1983 that a reasonably strong form of controllability implies of, of a control system implies that uh, you can find a smooth U of X, a smooth feedback law that makes your point asymptotically stable. So I guess a lot of people believe this. Um, and Roger Brockett considered this example system in his paper. Uh, some folks call it the Heisenberg system. Some call it the non-holonomic integrator. Heisenberg is related to something called the Heisenberg group. Um, this system is controllable in every sense imaginable. Not only can you go from point A to point B, if A and B are close, you can go from point A to point B without uh, going too far away from either, either point. You can do this in small times, big times. 
uh, very controllable, but Rocket showed that for this system, even though it's so controllable, has the property that you can't stabilize any point. And I should clarify, when I say stabilize in this talk, at any time, I mean asymptotically stabilize. I'm not talking about the outcome of stability. So by doing this, by showing that no point is stabilizable, uh, Rocket refuted that conjecture. So how could he have done this? How could he have shown that no point is stabilizable? Well, let's think about how we normally prove that a point is stable. So if you're lucky, you have a vector field, you just you know compute the Jacobian of the vector field, evaluate it at the equilibrium. If all the eigenvalues lie in the left-hand plane, great, it's stable. Okay, what if you what else can you do? You can consider Lyapunov functions. You find a Lyapunov function, some positive definite function. I mean, maybe you could think of it as an energy landscape um, in some cartoonish sense or some literal sense sometimes. And uh, you just show that the vector field goes downhill, that the trajectories go downhill the Lyapunov function. Well, here we're trying to show that the system cannot be uh, asymptotically stable. So you, what you could do is you could you could pick a smooth function. What's is it a Lyapunov function? And you can just check that. Well, you can never choose u to to make f of x u point downhill uh, your function at at every point. But then you just picked out a single function. So maybe you picked out the wrong candidate Lyapunov function. Okay, let's try another. Well, we can't try all of them because there's too many. We try to, if we try all of them, the heat depth of the universe will occur first. So this is not a viable approach to proving that this is not um, asymptotically stabilizable. So what can you do? You need to look for some obstruction to asymptotic stabilizability. And that's what Rocket did. So he proved this theorem, which is commonly called Rocket's necessary condition, where um, you can think of it as a test, Rocket's test. Um, and the theorem says that, well, if a point is stabilizable, and I'm just talking about smooth feedback, although you, that can be relaxed, um, stabilizable via smooth feedback, then it must be the case that the image of F, the control system F, is a neighborhood of zero. That is, um, after you apply F to all points in the domain, the domain being X U space, and then you get a point, or you when you, when you apply a point in X U space, you get a point in R3 in this example. Um, if you apply this to all possible points, you get a set in R3, and Rocket says that set needs to contain an open neighborhood or an open uh, ball centered at the origin if, if the point if the point is going to be stabilizable. But for this example, you can just check, plug in zero, zero, epsilon, delete x dot y dot z dot plug in zero, zero, epsilon. And okay, when you do that, zero there, zero there means u and v have to be zero. So that means this right hand side is zero, so it can't be epsilon. So no matter how epsilon no matter how small epsilon is, points of this form cannot be in the image of F. And so therefore, by Rocket's theorem, not stabilizable. Um, so I'll tell you how to prove Rocket's theorem. I'll, I'll prove something more general. First, I just want to quickly acknowledge there's a lot of uh, important work on stabilizability on other flavors of the problem that they're important, but just for the sake of time, I can't talk about. So exponential stabilizability, global stabilizability, time varying feedback, um, discontinuous feedbacks, these are all important variants of the problem, but um, I'm just gonna talk about regular vanilla asymptotic stability. Um, so before I tell you how to prove Rocket's theorem, let me tell you about a couple of generalizations, or not generalizations, extensions. These are stronger results than Rocket's theorem. So Rocket wrote his paper in 1983. At about the same time, there was this 1984 monograph that came out. Uh, I will do my best to say the names, Krasnoselsky and Zabrico. Surely I um, mispronounced them. Uh, and they were considering dynamical systems, and they wrote this influential monograph, did a bunch of things. In particular, they obtained a necessary condition for asymptotic stability of an equilibrium of a vector field involving something called the index of the vector field, the hop index, um, uh, which I won't dwell on at the moment. But so whatever they did, the control theorist, um, Jean-Michel Perron, he introduced a, um, a test or obstruction to, to stabilizability, if you will, which is strictly stronger than Brockett's, and then Abdul Reza Mansuri generalized. So to explain Perron's condition, let's define this set sigma. It's just a set of all XUs where F of XU is not zero. Okay, so then Perron proved this theorem. And to, to avoid some edge cases, let's assume that the dimension of our state space is at least two. So he proved that if the dimension of the state space is at least two, 
and a point is stabilizable, then the following has to be the case. This equation has to be satisfied. What does this equation mean? So H here is something called the N, H N minus one is the N minus one singular homology group. What is that? It doesn't really matter for the, for the purposes of this talk. All that matters is that this is some algebraic data that you can assign to a space sigma. And you know, it's if we took coefficients in R, this would just be a vector space and, and this would be a vector space. Um, but you can also consider other coefficients. I'm considering integers here, but these are just some, just some algebraic data. And so this says that if a point is stabilizable, then this purely algebraic equation has to be satisfied. And importantly, although I don't think anyone has pursued this, you can actually numerically test this condition. Um, there's a literature on computational homology. So you can test this. And uh, so it turns out this condition in Corona code is strictly stronger than rockets. So it can, it can detect a failure to be stabilizable even when rockets test would not. So this is for points. And then Abdul Razum and Suri, uh, 20 years later, showed uh, you know, the first result showing how you could um, come up with a test, a necessary condition for stabilizability for um, things other than points. So he just considered submanifolds in a Euclidean space. And his condition generalizes Corona's um, and it involves something called the Euler characteristic, which I will um, explain in a, in a slide coming soon. So these are just two sort of algebraic tests, which are stronger than rockets. On the one hand, they have the virtue of being stronger. On the other hand, they are more complicated and, and harder to apply, but they can they detect more. So, okay, so what are the limitations of these results? Well, um, So first of all, the, the, they all rely on some special structure of Rn in order, in order to even define certain quantities that we're using. So Rockets test that it says that the image of the vector field needs to be a neighborhood of the origin. Well, the image of the vector field doesn't even live in the right space in general for that statement to make sense. But it does make sense if we use the fact that we're in Rn and Rn is a manifold with very special structure, it uses something called parallelizability of Rn. Um, and also their results only apply to the special case that A is a point or a compact boundary list submanifold of Euclidean space with a quantity that I'll explain in a slide soon uh, called the Euler characteristic being not zero. So for example, Abdel Reza's results are totally blind to the case that the Euler characteristic is zero, which what's an example of something with zero Euler characteristic? A periodic orbit. So this can't say anything about periodic orbits. Um, I want to say things about periodic orbits, so I care about the, the case that the Euler characteristic is zero, but I'm also interested in things like safety. And um, safety is a somewhat dual problem to, uh, sta to stability, stabilizability, instead of wanting the system to go to collapse down to some uh, desired attractor, you want the system to go away from some bad set. So, um, so when I was in working in code lab, I was thinking about safety and, um, realizing this duality. And so because I was interested in safety where the complement of the bad set can have some weird topology, um, I, I needed to consider stabilizability of things that were not points. Um, so that was another reason why I want to think about this. Um, and even if you're not interested in safety, if you're just interested in, in um, stability, uh, just from working in, in code lab and talking to uh, the, the, the folks there, I mean, they tell me that they really want to think about stabilizing more general subsets uh, than equilibria. Um, and they would say, and for them, that means they want to, to stabilize templates inside anchors uh, in their terminology. So how can you test for stabilizability in such general settings? So I'll explain uh, two ways. So the first is the generalization of rockets test. And uh, it's based on work that I did with Dan Kodachek while I was here in GRASP. Uh, and then I'll also talk about some solo work I did uh, to generalize the Corona and uh, Mansuri tests. And I put in the footnote here, um, if you're interested, um, there's an exposition of my, my results and all the other results uh, in this book. And uh, the chapters leading up to it had sort of a tutorial on the, the relevant mathematics. Um, so uh, I promised I would tell you what an other characteristic is. So let me do that. So on the other characteristic is a, is a very old notion. And um, I'm still fascinated by it. So let me let me explain it. So I'm, consider a sphere. 
And let's break up the surface of the sphere. Let's think of the surface of the sphere as being a puzzle, and we're going to break it up into a bunch of puzzle pieces. And up here, over here, we're making the puzzle pieces triangles. So if you do that, you draw a bunch of triangles on, well, you can do the following thing. Count the number of vertices, subtract the number of edges, add the number of faces. When you do that, over here, turns out you get two. Okay, meanwhile, I can draw other puzzle piece triangles on there. I do the same count, vertices minus edges plus faces. And even though these are very different puzzles, they still form the same sphere, you still get two. And you, 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 you could try to do this again. You think, oh, was that a fluke? And it turns out, no, no matter which way you draw the triangles on the sphere, you'll always get two. And moreover, they don't even have to be triangles. You could do um, some more general puzzle pieces. So here, um, I guess topologically, these are triangles, but you know, here we have a decomposition of the sphere into these sort of four quadrants. And those quadrants still have vertices, edges, and faces. And same deal, vertices minus edges plus faces, you get two. Now, if you go to a shape that's not the sphere, so here's the surface of a donut, here's a beach ball, surface of a donut. Um, so there, we can still do vertices minus edges uh, plus faces, and you don't get two, you get zero. So it turns out that this count that we're doing, vertices minus edges plus faces, it, it is a property only of the topology on the space, it does not care how you draw on the triangles. I mean, subject to some mild in, constraints on how you draw them, like the, we're supposed to have the faces nicely match up with one another. There's not supposed to be overlaps. But so you get a well-defined number called the Euler characteristic of the space. And so here are some examples. The Euler characteristic of a point, well, there's no faces and edges of the vertex. So, the, so it's just one, one minus zero plus zero. Euler characteristic of a circle, we can get a circle by taking two edges are two intervals and then gluing them together along their common endpoints. So we have two vertices, uh, minus two edges, plus zero faces. So we get zero for a circle. And as we've been discussing for a sphere, it's two. And then because of something I'm gonna have, I think on the next slide, I'll just point out the Euler characteristic of a figure eight is minus one. Um, so this is a nice way to think about the Euler characteristic. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, you really need to, really just the next slide, I think, you just need to know this characterization of Euler characteristic. So if you have a compact, smooth manifold with boundaries, so this is just like some smooth surface that has a boundary, then that's, that manifold has zero Euler characteristic if and only if the following holds. You can find a smooth vector field on the manifold that points inward at the boundary, and is zero nowhere. So if you can find such a vector field, the manifold has zero Euler characteristic. And if it has zero Euler characteristic, characteristic you can find such a vector field. So, so I, I will use that fact to prove rocket necessary condition now, but I will actually prove something more general. I'll prove this uh, theorem uh, from a paper with Dan Kodachek. So here's what it says. It let A be any compact subset of your state space M, but assume that A is stabilizable. So if A is just some arbitrary compact set, it turns out it might not have any kind of meaningful other characteristic because arbitrary compact sets are can be super pathological. They don't need to be manifolds. They can they can be um there can be dragons there. And so it's not obvious that the other characteristic characteristic is well defined. But if A is stabilizable, then it turns out the Euler characteristic is always well defined. There's a caveat. It's not always well defined with the vertices minus edges plus faces bit from the last slide. You need to use something called Chekhov homology. But if you're only interested in A's that are not too pathological, like points, limit cycles, figure eights, anything, anything that would arise in engineering applications, to, to my knowledge, you can take the Euler characteristic to be the vertices minus edges plus faces. So if it's stabilizable, you have a well-defined Euler characteristic. And then now let's assume that that Euler characteristic is not zero. Then here's the test. So if it's not zero and we're stabilizable, then for any sufficiently small vector field X, you can find a state X naught and a control U naught, such that when you plug in X naught U naught into F and plug in X naught into X, the two are equal. 
Okay, so how would you use this? I'll show you some examples, but the idea is you, you can pick some clever vector fields X and show that you can never satisfy that equation for any X not U not, and that would show that A is not stabilizing. So how does this work? Well, let's assume we have the stabilizing U of X and let capital F be the closed loop vector field. I'm gonna sidestep the technicalities about the well-definedness of the Euler characteristic. Let's just assume it's well-defined and not zero. So um, by invoking a converse Lyapunov theorem, there exists a smooth Lyapunov function and a sublevel set, which is a nice compact smooth uh, dimension zero manifold with boundary N. So some nice compact smooth domain. And because it's a Lyapunov function, big F points inward at the boundary of this everywhere. And it turns out, this is the topology I'm hiding, that the Euler characteristic of A has to be equal to the Euler characteristic of this uh, domain N. Um, so because F points strictly inward at the boundary of N, just by continuity, if you perturb F just a little bit, it's still going to point inwards at the boundary. So F minus big X points inward at boundary of N, at least if X is small. And so by that Poincaré and Hopp result, so I'm really just using half that result of the poincaré hopp theorem from the previous slide, because the Euler characteristic of N is not zero, and because F minus X points strictly inward there, it has to have a zero somewhere. And if it has a zero somewhere, when we just plug in the definitions of big F, that expands exactly that there's some X naught such that X of X naught is big F of X naught, but that was the same as little f of X naught, U of X naught. And so that proves the theorem where you take U naught to be U of X naught. So, okay, um, I claim that that, is, that result is useful. Let me try to convince you. So here are a couple of examples. Um, one is this Heisenberg system from slide one. I thought it would be, or from an early slide, I thought it would be good to revisit that, but also um, maybe more relevant to those of you interested in robotics. Uh, let's discuss a kinematic differential drive robot, also called kinematic unicycle. We can do dynamic versions as well, but I just want to keep it simple. So we need to pick those vector fields X from the previous slide. Um, uh, Dan Kodachek likes to think of those X's as adversaries. Let me go back to the previous slide. He likes to think of these X's as adversaries that you need to be able to defeat with uh, F by finding appropriate X not U not, and where defeat means that equality holds. So we're looking for adversaries X that we want with the proper depth, when we plug them into the left-hand side there, uh, we can't find any states and controls that make the equation satisfied. So um, just using the same adversary from that Brockett used, but Brockett uh, was considering only constant vector fields, not any vector field. Um, this adversary works here to show that you can't stabilize a point as, as um, uh, Brockett showed, but it actually tells you a lot more if we use our result. Not only can you not stabilize points, uh, you actually can't stabilize anything with a non-zero other characteristic. And so, for example, suppose we only care about um, submanifolds. Well, if A is a compact submanifold, the only way it can possibly be stabilizable is if it's, uh, well, if it's, con if it's connected, it has to be a circle or a torus. So, um, so we learn quite a bit more beyond Brockett's confusion. Brockett said, no points. I'm saying also no points, but also at best circles and tori only. Um, uh, and you actually get the exact same conclusion for the kinematic uh, unicycle, kinematic differential drive robot. You just use these other adversaries to plug into the left-hand side of equation three and show that you can't solve that equation. Um, there's some other applications I was briefly mentioned. In the paper, we consider um, satellite orientation. So if you have satellite orientation with two or fewer thrusters, you can't stabilize any compact set um, uh, if it has a non-zero Euler characteristic, it's got to have zero Euler characteristic. Um, we also consider very general non-holonomic dynamics. Non-holonomic constraints are often given in the form of uh, uh, intersections of kernels of one forms, and these are the Fafian constraints. And uh, Fafian constraints, well, sometimes they can be globally defined, and usually they are, but sometimes they're only locally defined. But at least if one of them is globally defined, then uh, for non homonomic dynamics, you will not be able to stabilize anything unless the other characteristic is equal to zero. Um, so I mentioned there are applications of safety and I didn't spell out the uh, safety theorem on any slide. So I just wanna say though, um, 
what happens. So our definition of safety is if you start on the boundary of a bad set, you have to immediately enter the good set. And if you start in the good set, you stay in the good set forever. Um, I'm, that's not the only definition in the literature, but that's the one that Dan and I adopted in our paper. So here's a, here's a um, I hope plausible-ish sounding task. You've got a differential drive robot. It's got a camera on it. Uh, you want that camera to be pointed at the origin because something interesting is happening there. And um, then they're all, and you don't want the robot to leave the room. So it stays inside the boundary of that disc. And there's also some dangerous things like perhaps red lava pits that the uh, robot does, wants to avoid. And um, so it turns out if you could do this, basically on the complement of the bad set, there would be, you could prove there is, there will exist some attractor for the closed loop vector field in the good set. And then you can apply our stabilizability results to that attractor. And what you end up finding is that that adversary necessary condition for stability also as a necessary condition for safety. And so you can prove by, by analyzing the um, uh, other characteristic of a certain set that it's impossible for this robot to aim within say plus or minus 90 degrees or even plus or minus 179 degrees of the origin while strictly avoiding the obstacles in a, in a technical sense. Um, you can't do this with a smooth, uh, purely reactive, feedback law of the form U of X, but you can do this with time dependent use or with discontinuous use. And so a takeaway from this kind of result would be, I better stop looking for a smooth uh, safe feedback and I better start looking for a time varying one or a hybrid one. Um, so it limits your, uh, your search space. So now I'll tell you about um, uh, generalizations of the, the Perron Mansuri results. And um, so, but I think it's worth stating the theorem that allows that to be done. So it's this theorem that I'm calling the homotopy theorem here. And I was really excited to learn this theorem because to me, it, it feels like a fundamental truth about dynamical systems. Um, so here's what it says. Let's suppose you have two smooth vector fields, capital X, capital Y, on the same state space, same manifold M. And these two vector fields have something in common. They both have an asymptotically stable set A, but we're assuming it's the same asymptotically stable set A for both. So the result is under in this situation, you can always find some, some neighborhood of A such that after you delete A from the neighborhood, X and Y are homotopic over the deleted neighborhood. And now you might say, well, wait, so what any pair of vector fields are homotopic? You just go in a straight line between them. Very good point. The key is they're homotopic without ever going through zero. That is not always automatically satisfied. So it turns out I'll just, yeah. So maybe I'll just say this now, this homotopy theorem to the best of my knowledge, well, it is stronger than all of the results that I presented in this talk, and it is stronger, yeah, in everything that I will present in the talk. Um, so it, it sort of, somehow all of the theorems in the literature on these topological tests for stabilizability, uh, they're all sort of uh, different, like, facets of this top observation. This is my opinion. And um, so it's very direct from this observation. So X and Y are homotopic without going through zero. That means that they induce the same map on homology between appropriate spaces. And then if you just consider the, a hypothetical closed loop vector field of a control system, you can just directly get from this, this result here, which on the one hand, it generalizes Perron and Mansuri's result. On the other hand, it's stronger in the sense that um, it can say things, for example, about certain examples that those results can say nothing about. It can handle sometimes the zero other characteristic condition. Um, so I have an example to that is used in part to back up my claim that this result is um, the strongest. Uh, it's in two slides. I'm gonna skip it for time unless anyone wants to ask during the question period. But what I would like to do is say something about the proof, at least by picture of the homotopy theorem. So um, here's the situation. So uh, I have a cartoon here. Um, the trajectory is on the left here. They're going, they're traveling uh, roughly within the basin of attraction of A for one of the vector fields. And um, 
So if you pick one of the vector fields, let's say the X1, we can use the Lyapunov function for it by invoking a converse Lyapunov theorem. And this Lyapunov function allows you to do something pretty nice. It allows you to, uh, so it turns out if you pick any level set for the Lyapunov function, then the basin of attraction is diffeomorphic to that level set across the real line. And so what, what that means is you get special coordinates such that in the new coordinates, the trajectories of the red X vector field just become straight lines going towards the attractor. Meanwhile, the blue trajectory of Y does whatever it wants. And we want, this is the only thing we really know. Uh, and we want to somehow get a homotopy out of this. And the homotopy has to take place in the tangent bundle in this, in this sort of linearized world, whereas asymptotic stability is happening in the nonlinear world. So the idea is to introduce a very carefully chosen Riemannian metric which is somehow chosen to be adapted to this product decomposition of uh, the basin. It's the basin after you delete the attractor. And the idea is you use something from Riemannian geometry called the exponential map of this very uh, carefully chosen metric to map the nonlinear trajectories over into this kind of linear tangent bundle world. Um, there's an issue though. Uh, so this mapping, uh, is well defined everywhere going that way, but it's only invertible on this uh, tube. And in fact, it's usually not even invertible on that tube. It's invertible on that tube because I picked the metric very, very carefully. Um, so it's invertible on the tube. So what that means I can do is um, with, when the blue stays within the tube, I can just you know let, let the blue get mapped over here by this inverse the exponential map. But anytime the blue is about to leave the tube, I just straight line interpolate the blue to the red over here. And then I just keep doing that. And then, um, so what happens at the end, because as the, the thing is asymptotically stable for both, the blue will eventually be lined up pretty much with the red. And if it's not quite lined up, you just go in a straight line because they'll eventually be kind of in the same direction. And then over here, the, ve the vectors X and Y themselves. Well, this vector X, I can deform it into the big, vector x up there that I get from the trajectory by just going in a straight line. And then the blue vector here, I can easily just deform by going right there to the blue trajectory, which then gets homotoped up to the red. So they're homotopy to the same things. And then you can just homotope them back to where you started to get a homotopy between x and y. So that's the very quick proof by picture. This is the example I'll skip. Um, okay, so I mentioned that I was interested in stabilizability of periodic orbits. Uh, so I was really excited to apply these results to stabilizability of periodic orbits. Well, so can they can they say anything? So um, unfortunately, it turns out no. So here's why: if A is the image of a periodic orbit with the same orientation, meaning I think uh, x and y both have A as a periodic orbit, and they're both traveling around that circle in the same way. Well, if you just look at the straight line homotopy between X and Y, because they're kind of going in the same, they're pointing in the same direction, over a small enough neighborhood, that homotopy will never pass through zero. And so the conclusions of the homotopy theorem will be satisfied whether or not that periodic orbit is attracting or repelling or neither for X or Y. In other words, the homotopy theorem can only really detect invariance of the periodic orbit, can't detect stability beyond invariance, so to my sadness at the time, the homotopy theorem gives no information on stability or stabilization of periodic orbits. You can at least say things about safety, but not periodic orbits. And since this is the strongest result out of the Brockett, Perron, Mitsuri, um, Walheim, Kodachek results, they also give no information. So that's kind of a bummer. But this led me to ask, um, so why is this the case? And hey, could it be that periodic orbits might be easy to stabilize in some sense? And so I'll just mention some uh, ongoing work that I have with Tony Block. And the punchline is, um, surprisingly to me, I'm not saying this is always the case, but it is the case sometimes. The theorem um, that I'm sitting here says that for a broad class of control systems, including the Heisenberg system and the differential drive robot kinematic unicycle that we've talked about, any periodic orbit that you can create with a with even an open loop control, as long as it sort of doesn't self-intersect, it just does a periodic thing, um, that can always be stabilized with a purely closed loop smooth control. Um, I'm not telling you how to do it, I'm just telling you here's a hunting license to look for a control via some data-driven approach or 
or pen and paper approach if you want. And so not only can any periodic, or periodic orbit that can be created be stabilized, no equilibrium that can be created can be stabilized for those examples. So for at least for a broad class of systems, including these, periodic orbits are easier to stabilize. And that was surprising to me. So, um, so that's the end of the first part of my talk. We discussed uh, the, the test for stabilizability due to Brockett, Perron, and Mansuri, and generalizations of these. And I claim to you that in some cases, periodic orbits, perhaps surprisingly, are easier to stabilize than equilibria. So I'd like to turn now to the uh, Koopman part of my talk. And um, so um, applied Koopman operator methods, uh, many of these, I'll explain what those are, they assume that the dynamical system is globally linearizable. And in a sense, I'll explain. Um, but then the natural question to ask is which ones are, and it turns out which one are is going to involve something like the phrase that I wrote here, at least for a certain subclass of these. So, okay, so I put this uh, quote up here. It's from this recent SIAM review uh, survey um, by uh, Brunton and collaborators. Um, there's also an influential survey by Igor Mezich and collaborators uh, from about 2012 called Applied Koopmanism. Um, they're, they're both good. So we're considering dynamical systems uh, on a smooth manifold, just x dot equals f of x, f is some vector field. And this is a quote from their paper. So a central focus of modern treatment analysis is to find a finite set of nonlinear measurement functions or coordinate transformations in which the dynamics appear linear, even though they're nonlinear to start. So here's one interpretation of this, okay. We can interpret this to mean let's find an embedding. I'll tell you what that is on I think the next slide, such that so some function f with many properties, such that when you set y equals f of x and then you take its derivative, well, y dot just obeys linear, y just obeys linear dynamics. Uh, um, which is the same thing as saying if you let phi be the flow of f, um, it's the same thing as saying that when you when you flow along the vector field, then apply the embedding. That's the same as applying the embedding and then and then flowing along the linear vector field. And if you can do this, well, then you can just use linear systems theory to analyze your system. You can make linear predictions of, uh, of uh, your future state from your current state by you, but you know, modulo the fact that you have to apply these nonlinear maps f and f inverse, but assuming you can apply those then you're just in linear systems theory land. Um, so the fundamental question in my opinion is, well, when can you do this? Lots of people are doing this and assuming they can do this. Um, so I'm asking, well, when is it even possible? So, um, well, first of all, here's a preliminary observation. It's definitely not possible if you've got a connected state space and you've got a, and you've got a asymptotically stable set whose basin is not the entire state space. Because if that was the case, well, basins of attraction are always open sets. But essentially, by the Jordan normal form theorem, Jordan normal form theorem, uh, if you assume it embeds in a linear system, it turns out that actually applies that the basin, in addition to being open, has to be closed. So the basin is closed and open, and there's a theorem that you would learn in first semester of topology, which says if you've got a closed and open subset or a closed subset of a connected space. That subset has to, has to actually be the entire space. So this implies that if you've got a linearizable system and you've got uh, any asymptotically stable set, its basin has to actually be the entire space. It's got to be globally asymptotically stable. Um, so we might as well just consider the case of uh, linearizing basins of attraction. So that's what we'll do. We'll consider S here is an invariant set of basin of attraction. So consider linearizability. You can either think about it as being uh, linearizability of globally asymptotically stable systems, or you can think about it as just linearizing a basin of attraction within some non-globally asymptotically stable system. And also for fun, and because it's important, let's also study the case that uh, S, instead of being the basin of attraction, is just any compact invariant set. So in these cases, uh, this is all the results are based on this paper that I, this preprint that I wrote with my collaborator, Philip Arathun. And in all these cases, um, we obtain necessary and sufficient conditions for, for global linearizability. That is, when can you do modern Koopman theory? And um, 
Uh, and we consider separately, uh, there's a technical distinction, smooth embeddings and topological embeddings. So what is a topological embedding? A topological embedding going from S to Rn, um, it is, that is a uh, map that is con continuous and one-to-one, -one, but it also ha has to have a continuous inverse defined on the image of the map. Um, and it's a smooth embedding if it's a topological embedding, but also F and that inverse are smooth. This is not the definition you'll see in uh, mathematics textbooks, but it's equivalent. Uh, I hope it's clearer than what I would have otherwise said. So the, okay, and now the next I'm gonna need some notions about tori uh, to tell you the results. So um, for these results, let's think of the torus as being a product of circles, but let's think of each of those circles as just being real numbers, added to real numbers, but we add them mod modulo one. Um, so we'll think of the torus as just being like vectors with n real entries, but you only consider the entries um, modulo one. And okay, so then a torus action is kind of like a flow of a dynamical system, but instead of time, you have a torus. So like for a dynamical system, uh, like a flow, this T would be time, here it's a torus. So, so, um, so you need to, a torus action is a map satisfying these properties. So for the map, you plug in a state in S, then you plug in a torus element and that gives you a new state. And um, so our results are gonna apply to things called one parameter subgroups of torus actions. And they are flows that you get from a torus action by basically just evaluating the torus action along some uh, line modulo one on the torus. So now I can tell you uh, the first main results, but I'll motivate them. So if you have a linearizable dynamical system with S a compact invariant set, um, well, by compactness, compactness will tell you that if you can be linearized, you actually have to be able to be linearized by embedding into a linear system with purely imaginary eigenvalues. And you can't have any non-trivial Jordan blocks. So you actually embed after a diagonalization. If you're linearizable, you embed into a flow on CN, n uh complex space uh, with a diagonal linear imaginary matrix. And if you use this observation and you, you, there's a natural action of the torus on CN, you just rotate each of the factors separately. Uh, each of the circles of the torus rotates a factor of CN separately. That tells you, you get, it turns out the flow is a one parameter subgroup of the standard torus action. And that gives, uh, so that tells you linearizability implies one parameter subgroup of torus action. There's a nice, very nice result that should be better known. You might know the Whitney embedding theorem. There's a set of results called the mostow pillay equivariant embedding theorems that tell you basically directly that if your flow is a one parameter subgroup of a torus action and you have a compact state space, then you are linearizable. So here are the results. If you've got a compact Here's the smooth and continuous results. So smooth, suppose you've got a compact submanifold and uh, and you want to consider it's, it's invariant. You want to consider whether it's linearizable by a smooth embedding. That's the case if and only if you are one parameter subject of a smooth torus action. It's the same situation and for topological embeddings, except you replace smooth with continuous with a torus action and you need a uh, niceness result on the torus action to rule out pathologies. But these are if and only ifs. And um, so let me tell you some things that you can do with this. So uh, I see that I'm getting low in time. So I'll just try to stick to the highlights. If you use, let's just consider applications of the smooth linearizability result. So um, they tell, it tells you pretty directly, actually, that it turns out if, if S was an odd dimensional compact uh, connected submanifold with at least one isolated equilibrium, then because there's because of the isolated equilibrium and the odd dimensionality, no matter how hard you try, there is there does not exist any. Uh, no, matter, no matter how hard you try to find one, you cannot linearize by a smooth embedding. Um, also, because we I mentioned the poincare hoff theorem earlier, here's an application of that. So if you are um, linearizable by a smooth embedding and you're a compact submanifold, if you have at most finitely many equilibria. Then there's a relationship between them and the topology. The other characteristic of your submanifold is just the number of equilibria. Um, so here's another point of view, because uh, the torus actions are a bit abstract. So in order to get our hands on what are these linearizable things, so now I'm going to consider not the smooth case, but just the continuous case. 
Um, it turns out you can define some kind of wacky class of topological spaces called pinched torus families. And you can define quasi periodic flows on pinched torus families. And I've shown, just shown some, ex I wouldn't worry about the definition. I just showed you some examples up there of uh, these wacky spaces. And some can be nice and manifolds, like the Mobius band on the right, but some can have pinches. And so it turns out um, another way to understand our results is that if you have a compact invariant set, you're linearizable by a topological embedding if and only if you're some uh, something like that. And so there are simpler examples than these, but these were interesting to me because these were wacky examples that I never thought would be linearizable, and they are. Uh, so I want to tell you about part two of the theorem. It's the part where we're not dealing with a compact invariant set. We have a basin of attraction. And um, so the results involve something called an asymptotic phase map, which is a map commuting with the flow as shown. And it turns out that you are linearizable by a topological embedding. Well, even only if the attractor uh, is linearizable by topological embedding, so satisfies the conditions from the previous slide, but also if the attractor has continuous asymptotic phase. The smooth result is similar, but there's some additional details. And I think um, because I'm getting low on time, I'm just going to go to the third part of my talk. So the third part of my talk is very short. It is about deep neural network autoencoders. So, um, so the setup is you have um, so, uh, some data, a point cloud, and some perhaps high dimensional Euclidean space. And then some points we're assuming uh, let's say we're making the manifold, manifold hypothesis, we're assuming that points lie on a low dimensional submanifold. And we'd like to reduce the dimensionality by, if the submanifold is K dimensional, we'd like to describe the points which is K parameters. So this is a linear submanifold. Classical approaches like principal component analysis work well, but if K is not linear, this is the more challenging manifold learning problem. So one approach is to look for an encoder where or an autoencoder built out of the composition of an encoder and a decoder. The encoder goes from the high dimensional space to the low dimensional space. And the decoder does the opposite. And we, we want them both to be continuous. This would be the case if you have neural networks with continuous activation functions. So an ideal autoencoder is one such that for any point in your submanifold K, any point X, after you encode it and then decode it, you just get the point back. So we get a perfect reconstruction, but from compressed information, because the output of that is a compressed representation of X. So um, interestingly, even though everyone uses these, or a lot of people use them, they, they don't usually exist. Perfect autoencoders don't exist because existence implies that your K-dimensional submanifold would topologically embed in RK, and that is not true of most K-dimensional submanifolds. In particular, it's never true if they're compact and without boundary. So for example, a sphere or a circle. Okay, well, if they, so autoclaves can't work, uh, and yet they seem to. Um, so I'm going to be talking about results from my paper with Eduardo Sontag, and Eduardo did this nice experiment where he took not just one manifold, but two manifolds. So these are our K together. He used a neural network architecture, such as shown at the top. Actually, there's more nodes in the hidden layers than he's showing, but otherwise, it's uh, that's pretty representative. And so we, just, you know, turn the crank on TensorFlow, decode this, all these red and blue points get set into this one dimensional latent space. And then when we decode, that's the encoding, and when we de decode them, we get the circles. They have these little, you know, small errors, but it looks like it does a pretty good job. Um, so, how the heck could that work? Here's my explanation. So, a pair of circles, we'll do the more general explanation next. Uh, after you uh, takes after you uh, delete small intervals from them, well, then they just become intervals. And so you can diffeomorph the complement of intervals in these guys into subsets of the real line and then diffeomorph back. And then you can just extend those diffeomorphisms arbitrarily. And that will give you autoencoding, which is arbitrarily good, at least on the complement of some arbitrarily small set. But circles are not special. You can actually do this in general. So um, given any k-dimensional submanifold, rather than delete intervals from the circle, you can actually delete either uh, something called a cut locus, which is from Riemannian geometry, or the top cells uh, from something called the, uh, a Morse complex of a polar Morse function. And um, I'm citing here a paper of Dan Kodacek that proves you can do this. 
And so you thicken them first, then delete them. And it turns out you can always do this, delete. And what you get is just a k-dimensional disk in RK. So I have something weird, not a disk. I delete the blue and I get a disk topologically. And so you can just take the encoder to be an extension of this diffeomorphism, decoder to be an extension of the inverse diffeomorphism. You can always do this. And so what you get, you can prove a result that says, well, um, if I have a finite union of compact submanifolds with or without boundary, each of dimension at most k, um, then I can always find an autoencoder that encodes arbitrarily well on k, except, except in some bad set of arbitrarily small measure. And this bad set can always be chosen to be disjoint from any finite data set um, and to have some other nice properties. And so if you just have a finite training data set, your autoencoder can just learn a bad set on the complement of data. And that seems to be what happens. So you can ask, um, is this result optimal? Like, can you take the bad set to be smaller? For example, measure zero. And it turns out you can't. And I think I'm out of time to explain why. But the idea is that, well, at least it, consider the case that K is a compact manifold without boundary. And then it turns out in supremum norm, your autoencoder will always have to do um, worse than some well-defined number called the reach, in, which is the, related to curvature. Um, and uh, so even though you can, our results imply that you can get the L2 norm arbitrarily small always for an autoencoder, but the supremum norm will always be at least as big as this number of the reach. Um, so the proof of that uses something called degree theory and check cohomology. Uh, so I'll just skip that and I'll stop there. So just to remind you, um, the deep, neural, the deep neural network autoencoders, topology says they can't work, um, and yet they do. I offered an explanation why. And I want to thank you all very much for your uh, time and, and attention and for coming to the talk. And I'd uh, be happy to hear any questions. Thank you. Hi, I just actually had a question about how the Euler characteristic. Uh, oh yeah, it's a equilibrium number for the equilibrium. Number. Oh yeah, for the Gutman result. Yes. Good question. Um, yeah. So what? Okay. So if it's so we're, we have a compact manifold as we're assuming. So uh, if it's linear school, then by the previous one of the theorems. Uh, the flow is a one parameter subgroup of a torus action. And then there's a, a nice, really nice theorem from Lie group theory called Lochner's linearization theorem. It's sort of like a Harman Grobin type theorem, but it's it's not for Harman Grobin's for flows, which are group actions of the real numbers. This is for group actions of other groups. And it tells you that uh, if you zoom in on any equilibrium, you can always find some local coordinate system on a neighborhood of that equilibrium in which your uh, in which your flow uh, gener in which your flow becomes um, just a linear flow, and moreover, it's the linear flow of a uh, diagonal or sorry, not it's a it's a linear flow of a skew matrix, and uh, and also because this equilibrium is isolated, uh, that skew matrix has to be invertible, and so what what you end up finding out is that if you're a linearizable um, flow, then the hop index the Hopf index is um, related to the Poincaré Hopf theorem. It's a number you can assign to equilibria. So the Hopf index of any isol isolated equilibrium has to be a plus one. And now going down here, the Poincaré Hopf theorem says that if you have a vector field on a compact manifold um, it, with, with isolated equilibria, each one of these has a, has a Hopf index. It's an integer. You add them all up. And the Poincaré Hopf theorem tells you when you add them all up, that number you get is equal to the Euler characteristic of the manifold. And the, but the, the thing that happens here is because we don't have to add up all the indices because the, all the indices are one. So the, the sum of the indices is just the total number of the equilibria. That's a lot. And the next question, I'd be happy to talk offline uh, about this and point you to some, some references. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. In this stabilization stuff, can you talk about the role of caring about the vector field being non-zero? Does that have to do with, like in the differential drive robot, you, like we're caring about being able to do, being able to stabilize certain configuration sets without 
um, without just like stopping everything. Uh, oh, I see. It's like, oh, oh, so for example, the safety examples. Yeah. When you're thinking, oh yeah, because you're saying, um, well, correct me if I'm wrong. I think, I, I mean, I think you're saying that, um, well, like, why don't you just make the the control be such like be state what? Is that what you're saying? Like, why don't you just make it? Why don't you need to make just make this not move, and then it won't get into the lava? Is that what you're? Yeah. Um. Well, you could do that. Uh, one issue though is I want the camera to be pointed here. Oh, right. Yeah. Um. But another issue is that I want to be I want a good uh. I want a good safe control law for any initial state, and like okay, so imagine I have an initial state where I'm not dangerous, but I almost am. Like I'm right on the boundary of this orange. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just stay put because I'm singeing the wheels on my uh, robot because because this is lava right here. So I, what I want is like if I start with one wheel just touching, I want to immediately drive away. That's fine. So that's the why I don't want the robot to just stay put. In addition to the pointing the camera at the origin. And is the the non-zeroness of the vector fields does that correspond to? Not to to not needing to stay put. Oh, if, well, that, oh, that... if, if they stay put, then the vector field will be zero because I'm not moving. Okay. Um, and then if they're not, if it's not zero, could be good or bad because it could push me into the lava. But I want it to be not zero and push me away. Okay. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Maybe time for one more question. Uh, you just mentioned that you. Uh, I did like struck you that the. Maybe periodic orbits are easier to stabilize. You say you, you are still doing research on it. Too. Can you give us some like intuition on why it is the case? It's like yeah, my intuition is that um so I have some like mathematical intuition, but I also have some just regular intuition and and or a little more concrete. I think um so if you just have an equilibrium, then if it's stabilizable, it's saying like at a single point, you can find directions pointing towards that equilibrium all around it. Mm -hmm. For a periodic orbit, uh, but, but but first of all, that might not be the case. Like you, but for a periodic orbit, you you get almost um, some additional freedom because uh, let's look at a single point in the periodic orbit. If it was an equilibrium, I need all control directions pointing to being able to point towards it. Mm -hmm. But if, for a periodic orbit. If I look at a single point, I don't need all control directions pointing towards it. I can have like some pointing towards it and in, in other directions I can't move towards it. But what I can do is go towards it in some directions and the other ones I don't worry about. But as I travel around the orbit, those control directions can change. So it's like if I, I can stabilize some directions here, but not others. But if I just flow a little bit forward along the orbit, now I can, I can do the others. Mm -hmm. So it's the fact that you're kind of moving around the orbit allows you to take advantage of control directions around the orbit around many points instead of just at a single point. Yeah, so it's also related to the type of system, right? Yes, uh, yes. It's not true. I I think it's surely not true that what, what it's not always easier, I think, to stabilize periodic orbits. I, I that's a guess, but I know it is sometimes. But it, it was it was very dependent on the specific class of control system. So I didn't tell you on the slide, but the class is um some big class of non holonomic systems. Oh yeah, and that's also what I guess because it has to be non holonomic to like achieve what you said, right? Because it has some degree of freedom in certain directions to achieve this. And for non holonomic systems, um, you can't stabilize points. So that's an easy. That's a big class where I can definitely say it's easier. Easier yeah, yeah, to stabilize yeah, yeah. because it's extreme. It's impossible to do points. Possible to do periodic orbits. Thanks for the question. Yeah, I think we're out of time for questions. But thanks for the great questions and thanks for the great talk. And I'm sure if anyone has more questions, they can follow up afterwards.